<laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff this week. Uh, we'll talk about some more CSS. We'll talk about browser compatibility issues. We will talk about uh, web page design and we'll talk about the project. That's all it's in essence I said. Um, probably took longer to say it the first time around. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is adding um, different sorts of selectors. Right now we talked about selectors that look like this in our CSS file. So if we go in here and if we look at our CSS file, we'll notice that we have body, header, h1, h2, h3. And those are all um, HTML tags. So what that means is that means everything on the page of that HTML tag gets this rule. All right. Sometimes we want a, a finer degree of control. We want maybe just certain things on the page to get a rule. For example, let's say, um, you know, this is this is our article and all that. Let's say for whatever reason I want to emphasize that particular heading. All right. There's something special about it. It's maybe the featured section or featured article or something like that. All right. Now, that is in a H3 tag, I believe. It is. If I were to go and change this style rule for H3, everything would get that style rule. All the H3s, that is, would get that style rule. Let's say I just want to change that one H3. Well, you can do that a couple different ways. And the, the two ways are similar, uh, and there's one key difference. The first way we can do that is by assigning an ID to the element and then creating a, si uh, a style rule based on the ID. So, for example, I could say in my HTML file, I could put on that H3 an ID equal special. All right. That ID is like sort of the, 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 the name. It identifies that particular tag. Now, if you think about it, your student ID or your student ID number, how many people have the same student ID number as you? No one does, right? That'd be, that'd be a problem if they did, right? People would enter grades, and who got the grade? You or, or your doppelganger? You know, I mean, uh, who would the bill go to? Uh, who, you know, who gets the diploma at the end? You know, there'd be all sorts of problems with that. When you identify something, you got to point to just one thing. It has to, you know, to really identify something, it must be unique. All right, there can only be one thing for that given ID. So if I say ID special here, I can't have anything else on the page that has an ID of special. All right, that'll mess things up at some point. Let's just put it that way. All right, what I can do then is I can define a style rule for just the special ID. Now, how do I define a style rule for an ID? Well, with the HTML tags, I just put in the name of the HTML tag. <clears throat> with an ID, I have to prefix it with a pound sign. So I would say pound sign special. And then I could put in something to make it different. Color red, let's say. Font size <clears throat> 1.5M. Color red, we've gone over before what that means. I mean, the color of the text will be red. Font size 1.5M means that the font size will be emphasized one and a half times. So it will be like 50% bigger than it would ordinarily be. That's what 1.5M means. So if I go and save this now, go 
and save this and save this. Absolutely nothing happens. Well, you got it. Oh, all right. I do have it. All right. So it's bigger and it's in red. All right. So that's with an ID. To summarize an ID, you can put an ID on any HTML element. All right. It needs to be unique. That is, there can't be multiple things that have the same ID. You proceed it with a pound sign, and then that's the style rule. Now, very similar to the ID is a class. And the difference between an ID and a class is that there can be more than one member of a class. Whereas an ID, um, you know, um, an ID implies that it's unique. You know, to continue the student analogy, we could have full-time students versus part-time students. Those would be classes, right? Now there's more than one full-time student, there's more than one part-time student. All right, so that would be example of classes. A class can have many members, all right, whereas an ID should only point to one thing. The way you work with a class is you can go in and you can assign a class to any element and um, It's hard to, you know, it's hard to think of, of something in this case, but I'll say that these articles are less important for whatever reason. You try to make your class names and IDs very descriptive so people understand why you're going through the trouble of assigning it a separate class or ID. So in this case, I'm being a little vague. Uh, ideally, you'd be, you'd be a little more specific, all right? But here I'm saying those paragraphs are somewhat less important than the rest of the paragraphs. So good design principle is something that's less important, maybe it's a little smaller than everything else, all right? So what I'll do here is I'll go in and I'll create my style rule. Now, like the ID, I put something before the name of the class to indicate, hey, this isn't an HTML tag, this is a class. And in this case, for classes, it's a period. And we'll make it tiny to really dramatically show the difference. keep forgetting I have to say both of them. All right, and there, that looks pretty unimportant now, doesn't it? All right, okay, so we have those three things at our disposal. Now, one thing we'll learn later on is we can mix and match. For example, we can say in the header section, everything that has a class of less important is 0.7 times its normal size. But in the body, or, or but in, the, uh, in an article section, everything that's less important has a size of 0.9. You just chain them together. You say header, dot, and then the name of that. But we'll get into all that later. This is where really um, the endless variation that you get in CSS comes from mix mixing and matching all these different ways that you can define rules and all the different ways that you cascade. All right. So I did want to introduce at this point. Believe me, we'll go we'll go over this in much more detail later on. But um, if if you want to exert a little more control and a little more fine tuning on your web pages, um, this is this is one thing that you can do. All right. Now, some of you have noticed already um, a variation in your page. I got an email from a student, and I was talking to a student in lab last week. Uh, of your page looking different in different browsers. All right. Let's talk a little bit about why that happens and let's talk about a little bit about what we can do about it. <clears throat> um, I say a little bit because I'll, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to uh, edit myself because this is a giant topic and we could go on for, for days uh, about it. Um, the, diff the, the reason is, the reason it looks different is each browser is its own application that 
does its best to follow the rules of HTML and CSS. All right? Sounds easy enough, right? So why do the pages look different in different browsers? Well, for a couple reasons. And some of them are human error, and some of them are the fact that creating web browsers is a tricky business. All right? The human error part is just like any other human error. Hey, browser makers are made, browsers are made by people just like everything is made by people, right? Therefore, you know, the rule says it's supposed to work like this. In some cases, people that made the browser get it wrong. So maybe your page will look one way in Firefox and another way in Internet Explorer. Maybe the developer of Internet Explorer got it wrong and the developer of Firefox got it right. Or maybe vice versa. A lot of times people look at web pages and say, oh, my web page looks great in Internet Explorer but lousy in Firefox, or just the opposite. Typically when that happens, it's because the person's been viewing it in one all the, all the way along, and then when they're all done, they go back and look at it in another browser uh, and find that. It gets even trickier because browsers have different versions. So something may work in one version of a particular browser and work in uh, another and not work in another version uh, of the browser. Examples of common web browsers, and I think we have three loaded on this machine, are um, Internet Explorer, of course, uh, Firefox, and Google Chrome. But there's others as well. There's the Opera browser, um, there is Safari if you're using a Mac, uh, and there's a bunch of other ones as well. So one reason why browsers simply uh, don't work is, is just simple human error. The specifications for how an HTML page and how, uh, is supposed to work and how CSS is supposed to work are lengthy and they're written in very precise mathematical terms and they can be confusing. So, yeah, okay, people are human, they make mistakes. So that's part of it. And sometimes they're rushing to get a version done and they don't test it thoroughly or whatever. All right, they're humans, they make mistakes. The other problem is a little more um, structural. In other words, it's not as though the W3C, which is the organization that creates these standards, publishes a standard today and says, okay, today, September 24th, here is our standard for HTML5. Now web browser makers go and implement it. And they'll work on it and maybe you know, by January 1st, they'll have a version that works on, you know, that, that works and displays that. These standards evolve, all right? In other words, there's different drafts that come out for these standards before they're accepted. And browser makers don't want to wait till the last minute, so they start working on the standard before it's completed, all right? Which means a couple things. First of all, they're not going to get everything, right? Because it's a moving target. They're developing stuff as features are being added to, uh, to, to the specification. And things may change. And because of all these factors, browser makers are shooting for a moving target. So at any point in time, you may have a browser that uh, supports some features of the new specification and doesn't support other features of the specification. Now, that, it doesn't matter if people were perfect, you're going to have that problem, right? Because unless you wait until the specification is defined and then go and do it, but no browser maker wants to do that. No one wants the other folks to get a jump on them, right? So they're going to jump on the specification I I as soon as they can. There is a good, there's actually a couple good websites that I saw. Um, that I saw concerning this. Let's, let's look at the page. All right. And it shows some CSS things, and it shows some HTML5 things, and it shows other things. So, for example, um, there is a 
new semantic elements. All right. This shows you that IE 7 and 8 don't support these. Firefox from 12.0 to 17 do support these. And so on down the line. So these browsers support them, these browsers don't. I believe, yeah, this is referring to the section, the article, the aside, the H group, the header, the footer, the nav, the things that we were learning. So if you notice something here, all right, IE does not support those elements, Internet Explorer. And that was the root of the problem that both students approached me with, is that the, the issue that IE had was with some of these new tags in HTML5, the header and the footer and so on. All right. And this, so, so this is useful in determining, you know, what's okay and what you can use and what you can't use. The canvas element used for like drawings and animations. The video element. And so on. So you can use this site to sort of look and see um, if, it, if it doesn't, uh, if a feature is supported or not. Uh, really, the bottom line comes down to testing. You need to test your page in as many platforms and in many browsers as you possibly can. And that's difficult, you know, because you don't have 10 different machines. You know, you don't have a Mac machine at home and a Linux machine, probably not anyhow, and a Windows machine that you can test in, in a variety of different platforms. All right? So in the purpose of this class, we'll make sure we test in a couple browsers and we'll just do our best. Now, um, no Microsoft jokes here, but Internet Explorer does seem to be sort of the odd man out, all right, or the, the odd browser out, all right? And there's reasons for this. For one reason, um, irrespective of who did a better job developing browsers, Chrome browser, Firefox are all based sort of on the same thing, on the same code. So yeah, they're going to act similar. Whereas Microsoft doing things their own way is going to be unique, either good, bad, or indifferent, right? They're going to have unique characteristics. Um, so you'll see a lot of things, particularly in IE 8 and previous, that don't work in, in one browser that work, uh, or that work in one browser like Firefox or Chrome or whatever that don't work uh, in another browser. So, what do you do if you run into this? What do you do if you run into this? And that's a great question, right? Um, there is a, a few pages in the book that I want to uh, alert you to. Um, it, it's, a, it's in a future chapter, but I think now is a good time to talk about it because people are starting to experience these issues. If you look on pages uh, two, uh, 286 to 289 in your text, they talk about this very issue. Styling HTML5 in older browsers. And there's one workaround for older browsers that you can put in on the bottom of page 286. Then on the next page, they show um, a workaround for Internet Explorer. And we're going to experiment with that and see if it works. And I encourage you to try this if you run into any browser compatibility issues between IE. All right. We actually have a browser compatibility issue in the page that we were just looking at a second ago. It's a small one, but it's, it's, an, it's an issue nonetheless. All right. Here is this page in the Chrome browser. Notice the color of that headline, of that heading. It's sort of a light green. If you view the same page in Internet Explorer, you notice the heading is a darker green. All right. I'll make it a, a, a bigger difference uh, in color so it's very obvious. Let's make this some sort of orange. FF9900. That should be a 
should be sort of orange. IE doesn't do anything. Google Chrome also doesn't do anything. Oh, change the background. I didn't want to change the background. All right, there is orange in Google Chrome. If we look in IE, it stays that color green. Now, let's go and identify why that happened. All right, keeping in mind that a likely cause, not the only cause, cause, the likely cause of browser compatibility issues, uh, especially when you're using HTML5, is the HTML5 elements. All right, that's sort of the first thing to look at, but it's not necessarily the only potential issue. So let's look at this. All right. In this page, that text that is the wrong color, digital photography made easy, is in the header tag. All right. The header tag is an HTML5 tag that did not exist in uh, previous uh, versions of, of uh, HTML. So if we look in the style, we have a style for that header tag. That's the one that's not getting applied correctly in Internet Explorer. So the new HTML5 tag for header, the style in HTML, uh, the style in Internet Explorer doesn't get applied correctly, so it looks different. Now, for all of these issues, the question you have to ask yourself is, does it really matter? All right? And there are purists among us, and there's, there's people that will say, you know what? Yeah, it really matters. I want it to be orange. It's going to be orange. All right? That's one way of thinking. There's other ways of thinking that says, you know what? In the grand scheme of things, I want it to be orange. But it still works. It can still read the text, you know. So it really doesn't matter that much. So my suggestion, first of all, with browser compatibility issues, is to look and say, is it significant where it needs to be addressed? Because if it isn't, then you kind of have to accept that developing and designing on the web is a little different than like back in the old days when you designed for print, where you could get things to look a specific way and it would look like that. You know, you print a magazine, every copy of the magazine is going to look the same. You, can, you have that precise control over the layout. Whereas with web pages, you can't guarantee that a web page is going to look identical because you know that people are going to be viewing it with different browsers. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. You, you can also figure they're probably never going to implement the header. Well, yeah, at some point, yeah, they will. In fact, IE9, uh, I believe uh, that that's implemented in. Um, then there's a question, you know, uh, so, so the first question is, is it, is it significant? The second question is, does it, this uh, affect a significant portion of my audience? So for in other words, if I find something, uh, a bug in, where it doesn't display right in IE4, I'm probably not going to be terribly worried about it, unless it's really horrendous, right? Because you know what, there's probably not a lot of people using that. There's probably a lot of people still using IE8. Might be some people using IE7, but you sort of have to assess that. And that's tricky business, right? The one thing that is part of the art of web design is understanding that you're not working in a perfect environment where you have a lot of control, where you can control every aspect of it. You have to, uh, you, you know, you're at mercy to what the client's running and all that. And you can make some assumptions and you can guess and you can figure things out, but you know, you're still taking your best shot at it. So, first thing, is it that big a deal? Second thing, does it affect a lot of people? Let's say, for the sake of argument, that the answer to both those questions is yes. Let's say, yeah, it's a big deal. I want that to be orange. That's a lovely color orange, and we'll be cheating our IE users if we show them that in green, all right? Secondly, let's say, yeah, that affects a significant number of people, because, yeah, a lot of people still run IE8. 
How can we fix it? There's a couple ways we could fix it. And I'll, I'll show you both, but keep in mind you don't have to do it both ways, right? I'm going I'm to sort of show you both at the same time, but my example is going to have like two solutions to the problem in it. So, um, you know. All right. One thing that you could do is I could go in and I'm not going to delete this code, but if we took this approach, we'd delete that code and would change that header to a div. Now, what is a div? A div is an element that existed in previous versions of HTML, and it still exists in HTML5, and it's simply a generic section of the page. Div simply means a division of the page, a section of the page. In HTML5, you can fine tune it. You can say exactly what that section is for. This section's a header, this section's a navigation, this section's an article, and so on. But the, the generic container of div still works. So I could declare a div and give it an ID of header. All right. Then in my style rule, I would change the style rule to say, all right, anything with an ID of header, I want to make look a certain way. Now I'm going to, for now, I'm going to delete this header. All right, I'll put it back in in a second. And now, oh, thank you. Yes. Good eye. There we go. Now in IE, that appears orange. All right. So, what's my workaround? My workaround in this case is saying I ain't going to do HTML5 code, or at least not this HTML5 co uh, code. All right. Which I kind of don't like, you know. I, I want to play with the new shiny toys, right? Uh, HTML5 is a new thing, and, and, um, it seems bad to do my web page an old-fashioned way just to accommodate some older browsers. Yet, that's still a workaround. That's still, in some cases, that might be the best approach. They talk a little bit about this in, on page 288, the alternative approach. All right. Now, that's one thing that you can do. I'm going to put the header back in now and show you another thing that you can do. And I've not tested this yet, so I'm taking the word that it works. But, um, but let, let's see. And this is on page 287. we load a little piece of JavaScript that does some funny stuff behind the scenes and the effect is it allows us to style those HTML5 tags even in Internet Explorer. Proving again that there's some really clever people out there to develop stuff like this.
So all I did is I just copied that thing that's in the book verbatim. And now it doesn't work. Let me double check my typing. Script SRC equals H HTTP. Google.com slash SVN slash trunk. All right, sure looks like I typed it in right. All right, that is the proper coding. Yeah, I, I shouldn't need to save the CSS because I haven't changed it, but let me let me Google it to see if I'm, there's something I'm missing. Could be a misprint in the book or. HTML5 shiv not working. I can't understand this. HTML5 is not working in IE8. Include this way that you reference that. Okay, they said add this code in there instead. Let's try this. And nothing. All right. Let's, for the heck of it, get rid of that. All right. Still not working. All right. Uh, this reminds me of a, a famous quote by Abraham Lincoln, and that is, don't believe everything you read on the Internet. All right. Uh, if you're really having a problem with this, we can play with this some more. In fact, I might I might just play with this, you know, and see and and, and post what I find uh, uh, about that. Um, or you can play around googling it and see if you have any solution. Uh, see if you can identify any solution to that. So, yeah, obviously something isn't right, and I will. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to try to troubleshoot it and come up with some sort of answer. All right. So, now this comes to the, the next topic. Yes? We also mentioned this modernizer. Have you checked that out? 
Uh, where at? Okay. HTML5 should put in some JavaScript language. So if you add... Yeah. Let's see. Ah, no, E. Yeah, it, it was. I am lucky that that was the particular junk page that showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Do you know if uh, JavaScript was enabled on that browser? Uh, almost sure it was. That was the... Um, that was the um, that was a question that I got prompted with. Yeah. So let's see. Doing this works. I'm going to paste it in there. Normally you would just link to it. You wouldn't necessarily paste it. You can link to it by simply giving the path of it. Yeah, that was definitely not a good idea. It looks like when you do the website, you check more the elements that you wanted it to handle. Yep, and I checked every. all this and I'm still not confident it's going to work. That's the question mark. <laughs> Still didn't work. All right. I'll play with this and see if I can come to some sort of solution uh, on this. By the way, anything like this where there's stuff that you do that's kind of goofy, all right, um, is, called, is typically called a hack. Not a hack like, you know, hacker breaking into people's credit cards and all that. But you're sort of, you're, you're sort of stretching and manipulating uh, stuff in a way that it wasn't necessarily uh, in to, yeah that was intentional yeah that's fine but but the, the first one should be in the same color as the second yeah that that's not the issue no no yeah because I really don't have two headers I have a header and I have a div with an ID of header so it should be able to keep that straight at any rate, little things like this are called hacks, all right? And we'll figure out what's going wrong with this, and, and, and we'll do that for next time. Our next topic is to talk about good and bad websites. In fact, that's, that's what you need to do for your next assignment. And you need to create um, a page, 
All right. You, you need to do some research online to find what some guidelines are for good and, and good and, and, and bad design pages. You need to then find some examples, and you probably already, everyone who's ever been on the internet has some probably already in mind of good and bad examples. And you need to explain why they're good or bad. And the page that you put it on should itself be well designed. Now we haven't done a lot with layouts, all right, to be sure, but um, you know, you should, you should aim to make it attractive and use good colors and so on and so forth. So, if I was going to ask you, um, what makes a good versus bad website, what would you say? What are some characteristics of a good website? No flashing text. Okay, no flashing text. All right. I'll uh, totally endorse that. Anyone disagree with that? All right. No music. No music that plays automatically. I'll add that catch. No music that plays automatically. Because if you give me the option to turn it on, if I really want to hear it, I'll turn it on. Now, you're, so you were speaking specifically of the, the, the junky sort of MIDI, yeah. Which, yeah, was great in 1998 or whatever, but it probably wasn't even great back then. But, you know, was maybe excusable in 1998. But today, yeah, not a good idea. So, don't start things. That, that are going to take a long time to download and are probably just going to annoy me anyhow and distract me from the content. Yes? That's another one of the, like, the old flash pages that would pop up. Okay. Long animations that go and, and keep you from getting at what you uh, want to see. Pop-up pop -up windows. All right. Every, all these things, I imagine, you know, are, are bad examples or, or examples of bad things. Anyone uh, have other ones? Anyone care to uh, go ahead? Lots of, like we talked about last week, lots of different fonts and font sizes and colors. Right. Overkill on the styling. That is overkill on fonts, overkill on colors, overkill on sizes. I like it when you when you get on the page, you know exactly how to get there. You know, like then everything is in a logical manner, and you don't have to like scroll all the way down. Okay. That everything is organized well. That it's organized in a logical manner. All right. Anyone have anything else to add? Forcing a new tab or browser. Forcing a new tab or browser window. All right. You don't like, I assume. Okay. Other comments. We'll talk more about this next time. In fact, you know, good thing to do would be to think of your examples of good and bad websites so that we can pull some of them up and take a look at them. All right. Now, if I can distill some of the main principles that people have been saying. All right. Uh, number one: get rid of stuff that is going to get in my way. Whether it be distracting me, like flashing text, or even worse, in some cases it can generate, you know, it can uh, bring on a seizure. All right. Seriously. Uh, so get rid of any sort of flashing animation that doesn't add any value. All right. Doesn't really help get the message across. It just distracts you, takes longer to download, and keeps you from getting what, what what you want to do. So, several of the things that were mentioned fit in that category. For example, the long flash animation when the page loads, that fits into that category. Uh, the blinking text, that fits in that category. The music that plays automatically, that gets in, in, in the category. Um, i trying to think of some of the other things that were said. Um, of the positives that were said, the statement was that you know, have the, the page designed and organized in a very clear, logical manner so you could see where everything is and you could get to where you wanted to go. All right. Let me ask you this question. If you were to think of, a, a, of bad web pages, all right, you don't have to name the specific one to think of, but think of a bad web page. How many bad web pages are you aware of that are too simple? How many web pages 
can you think of that are too complicated? <laughs> All right. That should be a tip off as far as what good design is. Is it, one second, is it possible to make a web page that is too simple? Maybe. Might be one that, that it's possible to make a page that's too simple, it doesn't have enough on it or whatever. But that's not the mistake most people make. And that's not the direction that most people are in. Therefore, the cautionary thing is to caution about not making your pages too complicated. Yes? On that note, on like a 1024 by 768 screen, uh, making a website that like have most of all the important information without scrolling. All right. Buttons, you know, maybe, you know, menus where you can navigate the whole site, not having to scroll away from that original button. Okay. That, that's a good thing too. Uh, uh, try to minimize the scrolling, uh, especially horizontal con uh, scrolling, but if you can control both of them, even better. All right. So again, just put it out front there, so uh, so that the user can see it and, and can navigate through. So sort of the key principle is that when you think of bad websites, or when you think of good websites, when you think of bad websites, typically they're too complicated, too much going on, can't figure out where you want to go, confusing, so on and so forth. It's almost impossible to think of websites that are too simple. All right. There's another way to view this as well, and that is in terms of the goals that you have visiting the page. All right. That's another way to, to uh, consider this question. In other words, don't focus on the way it looks. Hey, make the site as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. If it's easy for me to achieve my goals, it's going to be a good website. If I can go to that website and get out of that site what I'm looking for, then it's well designed. All right? Just that simple. If I go to the website and I can't get to what I want, I can't figure out where my stuff is or it's a chore or it's like pulling teeth or whatever, then it's probably a poorly designed website. So there's a lot of more specific guidelines that we can talk about, but those are sort of the big principles that are behind all of that. So when we talk about having clear navigation, well, why do we want to have clear navigation? So user can find what they're looking for quickly. Why do we avoid flashing text and blaring music and so on? So we don't distract the user from what they're really looking for. So we'll expand on this next time. And this discussion will lead into a discussion of your semester project. So we'll pick up on this next time. All right, see you up in lab.